What's going on, guys? This is Rob, and I know we're a few days late to this, but let's kind of let's talk about the Black Adam trailer, right? You know, trailer breakdown, Easter eggs, everything you missed, that kind of a thing, which is kind of interesting because I don't really see a whole lot of people doing this. And to be honest with you guys, I think this speaks more to how people view the DC landscape, where it's just kind of like, I mean, there are movies that exist, but at this point, and, and I'm not gonna, I don't really wanna tear down the DC landscape, but in truth, I kind of have a few ideas on how to redeem it, on how to like bring it back and make it this, this comic book movie landscape that should be better than the Marvel Cinematic Universe, because the reality is it should. Right, it, it really, really should because everything that Marvel Comics has done over the course of their entire publication history is built on the work that everything DC did, right? Like all the archetypes, anti-heroes, superheroes, villains, all that kind of stuff, they're all due to the work that DC did, right? They all exist because of them. So I think at the moment, what you have is the situation where like a DC movie comes out and like people will go see it, but in order for Warner Brothers to really kind of be elevated back to the place they were when the hype was there at the beginning of their cinematic universe, it really relies on word of mouth. We're past the point when a trailer drops and everybody gets excited. And now it's one of those things where like the movie comes out and if like people are nonstop talking about how great it is, like with the Joker, then everybody goes and sees it. But unless it's something like that, the movie just won't do very well, right? Which is kind of disappointing. But uh, having said that, right? So, so one of the biggest things about this trailer and it's kind of interesting, there wasn't really a whole lot going on with it, right? It's just like, it's kind of an expanded version of the teaser that we got. And there's not much in the way of, of the overall film itself. And a lot of people are kind of taking that as, as sort of the, the canary in the coal mine, right? That it's like, okay, this movie's just not going to have much going for it. It's going to be a very thin plot. It's not going to be very interesting. And that's going to be it because nobody who's making these movies is actually a fan of comics, right? Or at least the, the people who are you know, writing the screenplays and that kind of stuff. How much of that is accurate, I can't really speak to. But the important thing here is, is we kind of get a continuation or a little more of an expansion on what we've seen before. So the first thing is the Justice Society of America. Now, one of the big questions that I've seen a lot of people asking online is, why do all the members all the people in this movie appear so weak. Well, what I will say is to a degree, there's more than meets the eye to some of them. So most of the people in this movie are very, very weak. Dr. Fate is the exception, but it depends on how they do Kent Nelson. So here's the thing. Kent Nelson's ridiculously overpowered, right? Like this guy, of course, you guys know is played by, by Pierce Brosnan. And for those of you guys who are totally unfamiliar, right? Comic book noobs, you've never read a comic in your entire life. This is gonna piss off Dr. Fate fans, but they'll be okay until, you know, once I make my point, they'll understand, or they won't, I don't care. For those of you guys who are totally unfamiliar with, with, with uh, Dr. Fate, think of him as DC's version of Doctor Strange. Now, there are big differences. One, in terms of like comic publication history, Doctor Fate came long before Doctor Strange. <laughs> like a few decades before Doctor Strange. And two, depending on what era of comics you're talking about, he's more powerful. Now, it's waxed and waned, right? Doctor Strange is, is far weaker than he used to be. At the height of Doctor Strange's power, oh, I would say he would have he would have dwarfed the power of of Doctor Fate. But in the modern era, no. He likely he would he would lose to Dr. Fate because Dr. Fate is just, he's on that kind of next level of power beyond what Stephen Strange has. But in a lot of ways, they're strikingly similar. I don't know exactly how they're going to do his powers in the movie. I don't really know what role they're going to play. Truth to tell, I'm more interested in Hawkman, right? Uh, the, you know, the guy that's basically played by Aldris Hodge. I'm more interested in him. And the reason for that, of course, is, uh, is people are largely suspecting, and we don't really know for certain, but people are suspecting this is Carter Hall. And if it is Carter Hall, there's huge potential here. There's a lot that can be done here. Now, the mythos of Hawkman and Hawkgirl is actually really, really interesting, and it changed recently. So, you know, we'll focus more on, like, what happened recently in comics as opposed to focusing on the old stuff because it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, just based on what we've seen with the movie, with, like, the origin of, uh, of Black Adam in the sense that he was a slave at one point and all that kind of stuff, they're basing his origin on the New 52. And so, for those of you guys who don't know what that means, in 2012 or 2011, DC rebooted their whole landscape, basically saying that nothing we wrote before this matters. If you've never read a DC comic once in your life, that's fine because this is all basically new, right? So it's like DC saying, pretend we've never published comics before and read forward from there. The problem is there were things they did with like Batman and Green Lantern where you couldn't ignore it. You had to know about certain things because of how the stories were written. So not totally clean, but for the case of Black Adam, you never had to have read a Black Adam comic in your entire life. You could go and pick up Shazam, which was really a backup feature in the Justice League comics, um, and you could read the Zero issue for Black Adam, right, the villain story, 
And then you would basically know everything you needed to know in order to understand the accuracy of the character in the moment. So they're going with a new 52, right? So that, that kind of makes sense. And so going on, on that newer information and moving forward, Carter Hall was cool because the idea was that you had something called nth metal, which was like this, this metal that had what was in effect mystical properties. And it was actually a metal that if I recall came from the dark multiverse, uh, which brings in even more possibilities. But basically the overall gist of Hawkman is that he was kind of cursed with this, him and Hawk girl, so that whenever they die, they'll be reborn in human form later on. Now, while that may seem dark, it was actually a really cool and honestly, really romantic part of their story because it basically meant that no matter what happens from the time that they would die in their initial forms until really the ending of the world, they would always find each other. They would always be reborn and they would always come back together again. And so it was a really, really sweet and a really romantic concept for those, those two characters. Having said that, Carter Hall was also a beast. Do not misunderstand that romantic element, right? This guy was, was not Leonardo DiCaprio from, from Titanic, you know, where he's like painting French girls naked. That's not, that's not what he was doing, right? Like this guy was a, was a hoss. Like when it came down to a fight, Hawkman's the guy you wanted in your corner if you didn't have anybody else. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, Hawkman's cool, but I mean, come on, you know, let's, if you have the choice between like Batman, Superman, Shazam, I don't know, Green Lantern, you'd pick them. Yeah, you know, maybe Aquaman, but like, if you didn't have anybody else, I mean, yeah, you know, Hawk, Hawkman, he's, he's, he's number one on the backup list, right? So the guy was cool. I mean, I'm not taking away from him. I'm not saying he sucks. <laughs> I feel like I'm digging a bigger hole. <laughs> I feel like I'm making it worse, but, but in all seriousness, for real and for true, Hawkman's got it where it counts, right? And so, uh, the whole reason why him being Carter Hall seems really, really cool is because it brings in the dark multiverse. So for Carter Hall, like his, his desire in order to understand nth metal, the properties of it and all that kind of stuff, it took him on a journey. And what he ended up discovering was the dark multiverse. And he actually just ended up becoming this super twisted and dark version of himself. But for those of you guys who don't know what that means, the multiverse, as you know, it in your least presumably we'll know about it in DC Comics as you'll likely see it in Flashpoint. That'll be the point when we find out whether or not the dark multiverse exists. The multiverse as you see it is really only one side of the equation. It's a yin to a yang and the yang would be the dark multiverse. Basically this multiverse where everything bad that can happen does happen, right? Like every possible terrible scenario. So like just focusing on Batman, for example, there's stories out there where Batman basically strapped Barry Allen the Flash to the hood of the Batmobile, drove into the Speed Force and then basically came out as an amalgamation of Batman and the Flash calling himself Red Death. And yes, he's every bit as awesome as you think he is. There is a version of Batman from the Dark Multiverse that had basically taken over Cyborg and called himself Murder Machine. He was also really cool. Like, I mean, like one, they had amazing names, right? Like just the names were cool. The Batman who laughs, he's the coolest out of all of them that DC overused and just killed interest for his character. But basically Batman in an alternate reality in the dark multiverse killed the Joker, or I'm sorry, really the Joker killed himself. And when that happened, uh, like the this kind of just exceedingly potent and pure strain of the Joker toxin that was literally confined in the Joker's heart permeated out and infected Batman and Bruce Wayne basically turned into the Joker. Like it was nuts. The kind of stuff he did, man. Like, what is it? He, uh, he captured Superboy and Superman and Lois Lane, put them in like a, like a prison unit and then exposed Superman and Superboy to black kryptonite, which drove them insane. They tore Lois Lane apart. Then they killed each other. Uh, he killed the entirety of the justice league. I mean, it was nuts. It it was, it was just, it was crazy the kind of stuff he did. It was all just super dark and super twisted. But the fact remains, right? Like that's what the dark multiverse has to offer. Now, do I think definitively DC would go in that direction? No, but Carter Hall's exploration of it would be a great way to eventually segue into it because literally in the comics, Carter Hall was like, I'm going to investigate you know, where, where this trail leads and then was gone. Why just vanished and you never found out what happened to him. Like Batman was hunting on the trail for this guy and then eventually everything with the dark multiverse starts to go nuts. But that'd be a great way. Like if they wanted to introduce the dark multiverse, like you just have some post credit scene for Carter Hall where like he's just been experimenting with it or at least trying to track down his own history, understand it better or whatever. And then he just kind of goes into some cave or travels through some portal or goes to some location and just vanishes. And they never tell you, like you never get an answer in that post credit scene what happened to him. And then lo and behold, you get flash point 
and you get this glimpse or something along those lines of the dark multiverse and like what happened to Carter Hall. And it's like, okay, what's this dark multiverse? And you go from there again, that would take a lot of planning. Uh, it would take a lot of work and you would really have to have it fleshed out. And as we know, the DC cinematic universe is the opposite of planning anything out. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of the issue you run into, but getting back into our trailer breakdown, right? So you've got Noah Centineo is basically playing Adam Smasher. Now, for those of you guys who don't know who this is, this, this is going to blow your mind, right? Adam Smasher, I mean, he's okay, right? He basically, he can manipulate, he can control his body's uh, molecular structure to make himself bigger and make himself stronger, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The cool thing about this is that this guy was originally part of a group called the All-Star Squadron and then later joined the Justice Society of America. So for those of you guys who don't know, All-Star Squadron was kind of cool right it was really really cool so the way this played out and this is kind of this kind of speaks to the role of the jsa and i don't really know exactly how they're going to explain this in black adam i'm kind of excited to find out to be honest there's the old school way the JSA used to exist where they were in an alternate reality, but we didn't know until a story called uh, The Flash of Two Worlds, which established they were in an alternate universe. They streamlined and cleared a lot of that up in the 1990s when they brought the JSA back after a story called uh, called Crisis on Infinite Earths, basically the post-crisis landscape, which eliminated the multiverse. So the idea behind this, the JSA, as, as it'll likely be in the Black Adam film, and the way it was, the easiest way to understand it in the comics is that they were basically a World War II to superhero team that the JSA the reason why their their members were weaker is because they got their powers from like artificial means now one of the other reasons why they were weaker is because the JSA as it was redone in the 90s basically followed the form and function of the JSA as it existed in uh, back in the 1940s when DC Comics was originally printing their stories or All-Star Comics was originally printing their stories right characters back then in the 1940s were nowhere near as powerful as they would eventually become in the 50s 60s 70s 80s going forward but the thing about this is that that with the JSA operating during World War II, they were only one part of it. That the JSA was kind of like the Justice League of the 1940s. They were like the premier team. But you also had other teams around there that were basically smaller. One of those was All-Star Squadron. And the idea was that there was a kind of, uh, I guess a campaign that was launched called Article X, which was basically a superhero draft. And it asked any of those superheroes, which kind of defies the nature of a draft, right? A draft is like you're just brought in whether you want to be there or not. But it basically basically asked that anybody out there who is a superhero enlist in the military. And so those individuals who were capable but weren't really JSA material became all-star squadron material. And then they became material for, for other people. Adam Smasher was one of those. Now, again, he actually gained his powers from his grandfather. So it was one of those things that was handed down generational lines. That's also one of the differences between the Justice League of America and the JSA is that when it came to groups like all-star squadron, JSA members, people like, uh, people like that, a lot of their powers were inherited. Right. So you had uh, Johnny Quick and you had Jesse Quick, for example, right? That like Johnny Quick basically found out a way to access the speed force by using a mathematical proof. And he could shout that number and then basically become Johnny Quick, kind of a weaker version of the Flash. That was passed down to Jesse Quick. She learned the formula as well and could do the exact same thing. So it's one of those things where more often than not, you saw powers passing through generational lines when you were dealing with All Star Squadron, JSA, things like that, more than you did with the Justice League. Now, that kind of changed to a degree in the sense that like Batman had no kids so he had Robins. Superman has his son Jonathan Kent. Wonder Woman doesn't have any kids. Different things along those lines. So again it's kind of changed or at least has changed in that way. But at the end of the day Adam Smasher's cool. I think he's going to bring a kind of uniqueness to the movie that's not readily available from the other superhero films that we've seen. And then you know following that of course you've got Quintessa Swindle who's basically playing Cyclone. I mean she's okay. She can control the wind. I mean I, I don't really like pass over her because it's like she doesn't matter she's just a very simplified character but the cool thing about this and i think this really speaks more towards what will happen in the movie regarding black adam uh more than anything else is osiris and isis so for those of you guys who don't know isis is being played by sarah shahi i think is how you pronounce that i'm not i'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her name or the guy who's playing osiris so i apologize ahead of time if i absolutely butcher these names the reality is that isis is kind of the love interest of black adam him, sort of insofar that it's because of her the fact that he falls in love with her that he ends up 
not really becoming a hero, but becomes less of a villain. And that's something that we'll talk about, you know, once we get to kind of the, a bonus thing that I want to bring up, which is a lot of people criticizing the line from both the teaser as well as seemingly this trailer where Black Adam admits to killing people. So the thing about this is that with her being somebody that Black Adam wanted to protect, what he did is he gave her something called the Amulet of Isis. And what this does is that when she says, I am Isis, she basically becomes the Black Adam counterpart, right? She becomes essentially almost equal to him in power. Now, of course, you've got Osiris, who essentially does the exact same thing. He says Black Adam, and he becomes Black Adam's younger and less powerful counterpart. But the thing about this is that the, the character of Isis, that's what will really seem to hint at what's going on with Black Adam, because in the trailer, he talks about like the loss of his son. He talks about being turned into a slave, different things like that. And so obviously, the movie is going to focus on this idea that like there's a big hole in the heart of Black Adam. And I don't say that to like, you know, make a joke about it. I mean, I think that's really what it is. Like that aspect of his life is missing and having gone through all that, turn him into a very hard and a very bitter person. The idea of Isis and Osiris looks like it's going to fix that, that he's going to essentially have a family. So think of what you saw in the Shazam movie, right? Where like uh, Billy Batson was a kid who was like abandoned by his mom and left in a foster home. And he's got a big grudge because he feels like he doesn't have a family or anything like that. And then he shares his power with the rest of the adopted kids. And now they have their own family. That's basically what you're going to see here with Black Adam. In reality, outside of like the darker, more villainous aspect of it, I don't think you're really going to see a huge difference between the Black Adam film and the Shazam film. And you really shouldn't because they're very similar in a lot of ways. And in fact, more recently, the Shazam storyline and the Seven Magic Lands, oh my God, that story was amazing. I loved it. I mean, Shazam, as he's more recently been written in DC Comics by Jeff Johns, has absolutely been designed more for a younger audience. Audience, right for kids who were between I would say maybe like eight and like 12 years old but it was a great story and like at the end of it Black Adam becomes a good guy and like joins the Shazam family which was awesome I absolutely loved that story it was just fun right just just a, just a ripping good time <laughs> right it was it was absolutely great you know it's, if you want to read just a fun comic book story read that one right like read Shazam and the seven magic lands it's great you need to read the Shazam backup feature in the Justice League first which is not over Really lengthy. I think it's a total of seven issues, basically, but it's great, right? It's a really, really, really fun story. But that's kind of what you're getting here, right? You're basically getting this idea of Black Adam kind of forming his own family. It's really going to be one of these things where they're, where essentially, because of ISIS, Black Adam's heart is gonna, just going to become softer. He's going to become a gentler, kinder person, and then ultimately, you know, become more of a hero. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to become a straight up good guy, and he doesn't need to be, because Black Adam never really has been. So, for those of you guys who aren't really familiar with the nature of his character, Black Adam's very similar to Black Panther in a lot of ways, albeit more willing to kill. When it comes to, to Black Panther, he won't readily kill people, but the the big similarity between Black Panther and Black Adam is how protective they are. So when it comes to Black Adam, he rules a country called Kondok. And let me tell you something, man, like that guy, if it like, when you think of Black Panther, right? Like if you only know Black Panther from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as much as I love that movie, it didn't really give you an accurate comic book depiction of Black Panther. But like all the intelligence that you saw that Shuri had in the Black Panther movie, that's T'Challa. T'Challa is that smart. He could do all that stuff, right? Like Shuri's there and her role in, in the Black Panther mythos is more ceremonial than anything else until Doom War when she becomes the new Black Panther and T'Challa just becomes more of the ceremonial person. He's like the ceremonial Black Panther, but he doesn't actually rule Wakanda as king, but he will kill anybody. Like if, if Black Panther has to choose between letting the world burn or protecting Wakanda, he'll protect Wakanda by any means necessary. And he doesn't care what he has to do in order to do it. Black Adam is the exact same way. He is wildly protective of his people in Kondok. And, and literally he'll kill anybody that gets in the way. Like a really good example of this is in the Injustice comics, right? When Superman basically becomes this dictator for reasons that were 100% justified and he ends up uh, essentially conquering the world or basically forcing the world to fix its problems because the world didn't want to. There comes a point when like Shazam and Wonder Woman show up on the doorstep of Kondok and, and literally like Black Adam's like, I'm not siding with Superman. And if he comes here, I will kill him. And he could, to be honest with you guys, like, Black Adam, there's been times Black Adam has beat the sh 
out of Superman. It's it was it's been hilarious. But like there's there's a point when like they pin him down, right? Shazam because the powers are a little bit different in terms of how they work in Shazam and uh, in Injustice, right? Not everybody's as powerful as they normally are. Not everybody's as weak as they normally are. Things kind of change. But the important thing here is that like Wonder Woman and Shazam basically pin down Black Adam, and Black Adam realizes what's happening, and like they essentially know they're gonna turn him back into his human form. And when that happens, he's gonna die because he's exceedingly old, right? Like he's incredibly old he'll just immediately revert like he'll just turn to dust right because his body won't be able to handle the strain of being that incredibly old and so the result of this is that wonder woman like slaps him with the lasso of truth and it's just like what's your name or something like that so that when he says his name black adam he reverts back to to his own human form but there's a point in that like in that moment and it's amazing when he begs billy batson and he's like protect the people of Kandak. Do not let them come under the reign of Superman. He's that protective. So like literally, it doesn't really matter what it is. If people roll into Kandak and start causing problems, Black Adam, he'll kill them without mercy. Like he'll, he'll, he'll do it without the slightest bit of mercy, right? It's just, he's a really, really cool character. So that's why I say, in the movie, I don't really see him becoming a tried and true hero. I see him basically becoming a guy who is less of a dick than he was before. That's really what it would be. Uh, and so that kind of goes into this last little thing that we were talking about, where people were criticizing Black Adam's line that like, you know, like, like all these guys don't kill people. And he's like, you know, I do, because he does. Black Adam does kill people because he's not really a hero. I mean, you can make an argument he's an anti-hero, I guess, but Black Adam kind of stands alone outside of like the traditional roles of like heroes, anti-heroes. He just does whatever's good for the people of Kandak. That's really it. That's where his allegiance is. His allegiance is to his people. And so there's been times when like he worked with the heroes because the threat was so extreme, it would destroy essentially Kondok itself. And there were times when, when he sided against the heroes because the heroes themselves were a threat to Kondok. So like that's where his allegiance is. So he stands outside of the traditional role of heroes and villains. So with that being said, guys, uh, again, there wasn't really a whole lot to go on when it came to this trailer. I mean, there were some cool things, you know, but at the end of the day, it was just kind of a trailer that exists and didn't really give us a whole lot to talk about and to be quite frank didn't really build up a lot of hype i'm still going to go see the movie i just wish they had done a little bit more to make the film more exciting but with that being said or at least make the trailer more exciting with that being said guys we're going to bring this to an end and i will catch you all later peace